I wanted to come and, uh, and be with you. Christian is, uh, he's off on his, uh, his a week off after having done such a great job uh, this, in my absence during the summer. So I'm really, I'm really grateful um, for him. And, uh, and what I wanted to do is to, uh, is to be able to take the time as I've come back to kind of share with all of the, all of the, the worship services kind of where my head is at and what I'm thinking about um, and wrestling with uh, for me, but also for us kind of as a congregation as we go forward, the kinds of priorities, the things that I think are important for us. So I just want to, I want to give, have the opportunity to be able to talk with you about, um, about where my head's at and just kind of share with you a little bit about the pieces of my past, of my past summer. Um, and it really fell into uh, three different pieces. And, uh, and so I wanted to take these, these three Sundays, this Sunday and the next two, uh, to focus on them. And, and they all have to do with the, the, uh, the issue of transformation. Um, so today I'm going to talk about transformation of the heart. Uh, next Sunday I'll talk about um, transformation of the mind. And the following Sunday I'll talk about transformation of the will. Christian will be back um, next Sunday and he'll be, we'll be tag teaming it. Um, together, which will be fun. I, I, I have fun working with him. So, um, but I, I wanted to tie it back to this issue of the tongue. And, uh, and you know, the, the, the writer of James is saying, you know, that, you know, this is, this is you know, how, how deadly the tongue can be. You know, and this, this stuff that comes out of it. And so kind of where does that come from as we look at the things that we say and also the things that we do. And, uh, and so to be able to kind of, how does our tongue do those things? Well, you know, I guess we have to say that there's, this, there's a turnpike, uh, one way, that goes to the tongue, and it is from the heart, right? So it's the heart that is the thing that informs what our tongue does. Um, Jesus, as he was talking with his disciples, uh, the disciples were being confused about what it meant to eat unclean food and become unclean. So there was this debate about eating kosher things and not kosher things and stuff. And so they were, he was kind of talking with the, with the religious leaders and with his disciples about that, saying, well, there are some things we shouldn't eat. And, he, and Jesus just kind of says, no, 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 that's not the point. The point isn't, you know, you know that whether unclean food can make you unclean. He says this. He says, um, don't you see that whatever enters, enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these are the things that make someone unclean. Things that come out of the mouth are the things that make us unclean, and they come from the heart. And so it's really the heart that is the kind of the, the receptacle that holds all of the stuff that works its way out into the things that we say and do. So, so it's the heart that's the center of us. And so what, what um, the, the invitation that Jesus gives to us then is to be able to ask the question, so what's in your heart? So, what's in your heart? I feel like I should just go sit down. <laughs> and just kind of spend the next 15 minutes just kind of silence and thinking about it. Just kind of, what's in your heart? It's hard for us sometimes to be able to tell what's in our heart. But the fact is, our hearts have a little voice to them. And our hearts are always trying to talk to us. They're always trying to tell us the kinds of things that are inside of us. I'm scared. I'm lonely. I'm hurting. I want something. I want to fill something. Are this little voice that's in the center of us that is always wanting our attention, but it's a quiet voice. It doesn't overwhelm us except in a crisis. In a crisis, it overwhelms everything, right? But normally, day to day, there's this quiet voice that's constantly trying to talk to us. And uh, part of the human condition is that, that when we hear that voice, sometimes it just makes us feel uncomfortable. 
we don't necessarily want to be able to hear that I'm lonely or that I'm hurting or that I'm feeling guilty. We don't always want to hear those kinds of things. And so we look around to be able to kind of get ourselves busy with other stuff. You ever done that? And so the culture that's around us provides a legion of opportunities to be able to not think about the voice that's inside of us. I mean, clearly there are things that we can do. I mean, alcohol, um, drugs, all kinds of substances that we can add to ourselves just to kind of quiet that voice down, numb it out. That's true. Um, but there are other things that we can do. I mean, we, I mean, the media is designed to do that, is designed, don't think about that, don't think about that. Here, come think about us. Think about us. You know, if you don't have something to worry about in your life or you think you got big problems, politics over here, you know, give us your airtime, right? Uh, and so, you know, I don't know about you, what your life is like, but in my life, oftentimes I find myself, you know, I run from my laptop at home to my laptop, from my, to my PC that's in my office. I have a, a radio on, you know, in the time that I'm in the car. Uh, there, are, there's news, there are news reports, all kinds of things, and I have this thing in my pocket. This is my third kidney. <laughs> I carry it every place I go. It ought to be just implanted in me because I get my emails, I get my texts, I get pushes from every news service organization, all kinds of things, and it's all clamoring for my attention. And if there happens to be a quiet moment, there are people that I can reach out and talk to. And so I can talk to my kids, I can talk to my wife, I can talk to somebody who's out there who I like or, and avoid the people who I don't like and kind of find out all of the stuff, right? So our world is designed to compete with, to quiet this little voice that wants our attention. And yet, as we neglect that voice, then, then the, the things, the concerns that are a part of our hearts go unaddressed and only just get worse. And so then um, the question comes to us, well, so then how, how do I do that? How do I listen to my heart? And you know, the answer to that, at least in part, is is to be able to strip away those distractions so that we can listen. And so the, the history of the church has, uh, has two disciplines uh, that, they, that they recommend and have used over time, and it has been um, silence and solitude. Silence and solitude. Don't you just hate those words? Don't you? just hate those words. I mean, we run from those words. And yet, they are what's left when we strip away the other competing voices in our life in order to be able to attend to this little voice that wants our attention, that wants our tenderness towards it. And then, uh, it's amazing if we can find those spaces, what it is that our heart will speak to us. So I was at, so um, Ignatius of Loyola was one of those folks. Um, he, was, he was in the 1500s. He was a young guy who wanted to be a brilliant military officer, uh, like his father and his grandfather. He wanted to make his mark as a soldier, trainer of men. And uh, he got his best battle gear on, and he went out for his first battle. And, uh, and his leg was smashed by a cannonball. And then all of a sudden, um, he was not only sidelined, but in an excruciating pain. They were able to save his leg. Um, but he was now against his will, in silence. They didn't have the internet, no newspapers. And in solitude, because, you know, who wants, who wants a gimpy person around when, when we're talking about soldiers? So he's there recuperating all by himself. And somebody, um, while he was recuperating, gave him a book. And that book had the words of Jesus 
and lives of saints. And so he read those passages while he was laying there by himself trying to recover. And over the months of his recovery, his life was changed. His heart was changed. And he emerged on the other end to be able to say, oh, this is, so this is transformative. This is, uh, you, you change people's lives. And so he designed a 30-day a experience where somebody could go away and have all of those things taken away from them and just read scripture and just listen to the voice inside of them, and it'll be transformative. And it, and it has been the single most important tool for the, for the forming of Christian leaders uh, for centuries now. Um, and so that's what I had the opportunity to do in June. So all of those things taken away. No cell phone, no TV, no media, no politics, no nothing. No family. Father's Day came and went, never talked to my kids. You know, all those things gone. Just one guy who was my spiritual director who I'd meet with about an hour a day, and he'd give me four assignments. And I'd go off and do those assignments, and they all had to do with reading scripture and listening to this voice inside of me. Um, day five, I thought, what the heck have I done? <laughs> this is crazy. I was climbing the walls. And then gradually, as you work through the themes, things that you've been keeping quiet begin to emerge. At one particular time, I re remember reading a passage of scripture, and it just it hooked in me, and, and I realized um, that I am, I am still... I just, just furiously angry with my oldest brother. Um, my oldest brother was an alcoholic, um, uh, abused prescription drugs, and hurt people. Um, but he's dead. I mean, he's been dead for about four years. I'm still furiously angry with him, and I have a lot of unforgiveness in me. Well, so what do I do with that? So, and that's the point. Um, it's not just about finding these places of silence uh, that, uh, that those, those things can come up, but it is to allow Jesus to be able to touch them, to be able to bring healing and the word of his love into those situations, those places where we have been wounded, those places where we felt lonely, those places where we haven't got the things that we thought we needed, all of those things, all of a sudden, that Jesus wants to come to. There are things in your life, like mine, I don't want to think about. There are things I'm too ashamed to admit to myself. There are places where I've been wounded, I don't want anybody to touch me at. But Jesus does. Because he knows what it's like to walk around with all of that stuff inside of us. There is no place in your life no place in your heart, no place in your history or the history of your family that Jesus is afraid or doesn't eagerly want to be able to come, to be able to touch you, to be able to provide healing for you, and for you to be able to know how absolutely passionately he loves you. From the bottom of your bones, from before you were born, he loves you and wants to walk with you through it all. It is about getting a new heart. Getting a new heart. I think sometimes children's literature is able to communicate things in a way that kind of takes us by surprise. So I've been thinking about The, the Wizard of Oz. Did, I mean, so did you watch The Wizard of Oz, the, the movie? And so was that kind of a, a regular thing that, I mean, we did that every year when it come on and the scary monkeys would come on and I'd want to hide behind the couch as they're <laughs> terrifying, terrifying things. Um, but, uh, but there were, so the, the storyline is, uh, so here is, Dorothy, because of the tornado, um, ends up in the land of Oz, and so she's looking for a home, right? She wants to get back home. 
And so she's on this journey to Oz to find this, to find what she wants. She wants to get to a home. And then there are three other characters who are co-journeyers with her who want to go with her. Um, can you name them? What's that? The Scarecrow and the Lion and the Tin Man. Thank you. And uh, so the Scarecrow is looking for a a brain. Exactly right. Uh, he's got a bunch of straw in his head. And then the lion is looking for courage. Because he's, I mean, how can you be a cowardly lion, right? You've got to stand up. And the tin man is looking for a heart. That's exactly right. And, um, and so this, this, this journey of these four people, who, if it's four characters, who are looking for this fulfillment, this healing, and, uh, and uh, L. Frank Baum, who is, the, who is the author, had all kinds of spiritual and psychological insight as he, as he writes this. So, so they finally come to the very end, and you know, there's all the stuff about the Wizard of Oz, and then they come to the very end, and they're able actually finally uh, to be able to request the things that they want. And so they're before, the Tin Man is before the Wizard of Oz. And the Wizard of Oz looks at him, and, uh, and he says, As for you, my galvanized friend, you want a heart. You don't know how lucky you are not to have one. Hearts will never be productive until they can be made unbreakable. And the Tin Man says, But I still want one. And so then the wizard says back to him, he says, all right, but remember, a heart is judged not by how much you love, but by how much you are loved by others. Let me say that again. A heart is judged not by how much you love, but by how much you are loved by others. I normally put it the other way around. I normally say that my heart is judged by how much I love others. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the need um, to get some love. And so what do I do? Um, so I say, so I'm going to give you some love, right? And I'm going to give you some love. And you can have some love. And I got some love over here. And there's some love right there. All right? So I've handed out all this love. Um, but I don't got love. So then in my head, I say, well, in, this, in my heart, I say, so um, I've handed out all this love, and I'm feeling pretty empty. So um, I know I shouldn't ask for this. I know I shouldn't say anything. But um, where's the love, right? Where's the love? Paybacks. Paybacks. Where's my stuff? And so if you give me twice as much, then that's great. You give me the same amount, that's, you know, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. You give me half as much, it's kind of like, that wasn't such a good deal. And if you don't give me anything, it's like, well, not next time I don't, right? How different it is uh, if we, if we, if we re-switch the emphasis not on how much love we give but on how much we have received and we know that from the Christian message the writer John the epistle says um, we love because he first loved us we love because he first loved us and so there is this sense from us of being able to receive his love, to be able to get it, to be able to know that, that he fills our bucket and our bucket is overflowing. It's sloshing all over the place. And so now I'm immediately full. That's the first thing. I discover his love for me. And as I discover it, it fills me up. It, it fills me so much more that it's sloshing all over the place. I can't contain it all and I cannot help but splash it all over you. Because I got more than enough, and it's so great. And I just want everybody to just kind of be splashing in this fountain of his love and grace that's coming out of me. How much better it is 
than this place of scarcity where it is kind of like, I'll give you this, but uh, what are you going to give me in return? Oh, no, no. This abundance of love that comes, but it comes because we're able to be in a relationship with him where we're able to see him meet our needs and fill us, fill us, fill us, fill us, fill us with his goodness and his grace. One of the followers of St. Ignatius um, wrote this. Nothing, he said, is more practical than finding God. That is, falling in love in a quite absolute and final way. What you are in love with, what seizes your imagination, will affect everything. It will decide what you do when you get out of bed in the morning, what you will do with your evenings, how you will spend your weekends, what you read, whom you know, what breaks your heart, and what amazes you with joy and gratitude. Fall in love. Stay in love, and it will decide everything. Oh, man. So let's stand together and affirm the faith of our hearts and of our lives by using the form of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of 